Welcome to another episode of What Are You Selling? with me, David Green. And joining me today is someone who I've been waiting to get onto the show for quite a long time. We've been chatting uh, and it's the best time to get him on because, and we will reveal why you know, a little bit later on. Uh, so I'm delighted to have with me today Christopher Russell, the author of Rebirth, Divin- Divinity's Twilight. Christopher, how are you getting on? I'm doing great, David. Thanks for having me on. No, well, thanks for coming on. So I'm look, really, really looking forward to this because um, as, been, as I've mentioned to people that have been watching, and if this is your first time watching, please subscribe to the channel um, and give us a like as well. But if you've watched a few of them, you will have heard me mentioning in the Fancy Addicts uh, or the IFA Summer Reading Challenge. So this is one of the books that I read for that. And I was delighted that I did because it was... Uh, you know, it, it had so much of the stuff that I love, um, not just from books, actually, but from uh, you know, a big, uh, big video gamer uh, from way back in the day, uh, particularly the Dreamcast. And uh, one of my favourites was uh, Skies of um, of Arcadia, which was like steampunk and, you know, uh, sky pirates and all this kind of stuff. And then, uh, and obviously, I love fantasy, I love Wheel of Time, and I love Brandon Sanderson's work. So this book that you have created is just like it's like you've delved into my mind and gone okay I'm, I'm gonna put all this stuff in there just for you i know you didn't do that but when no, I we, we it, definitely I... have a mind meld going on uh, <laughs> because so so you were the dreamcast and i i'm a generation later and i grew up um i did some sega i did some uh what was it the super nintendo and nintendo 64 Mm-hmm. But um, actually, probably my first favorite game on the 64 was Rogue Squadron, uh, the Star Wars Rogue Squadron. Have you ever played that? I have. I have a big N64. I just love all games. So um, mm-hmm. Rogue Squadron and then, and then um, the GameCube version as well, Rebel Squadron mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Big fan. Uh, but yeah, so I just got obsessed with uh, space. Well, Divinity's Twilight takes place in atmosphere. The, the airships are like Star Wars battleships, but they've been brought down and they've been given a magical reason for why they float. Um, there's a, a resource in the world called Illyrium. It's what they burn in order to collect energy and convert it into other types. Um, I, I have an engineering background. We, we've talked about that as well, um, mechanical and aerospace. So it's taking that engineering background and history and uh, my mother was an English teacher, so there's the writing background. We toss it all into a pot, bring in the video games and the books, um, because uh, in addition to Rogue Squadron, I'm also a huge Final Fantasy fan. And okay. every Final Fantasy game has an airship that you get at some point and use that to travel around the world. And I thought, well, let's give that to these empires and nations. And then at the same time, we're eventually going to get our main cast of characters to where they have an airship and they can travel around and do things. Yeah, you know, um, that was one of the things that I did want to ask you about was Final Fantasy because I, I did pick up the, the hints of of, uh, of that in there. So that's um, that is really interesting, and that, and that whole kind of RPG uh, flavor that is in this because like the book isn't isn't lit RPG. It's not that genre at all. But there is little hints of um, gaming kind of world building in in yes it's like the events or what happens to characters or the different steps that you experience along an rpg that we have just completed a major battle and it is now time for us to have a sit down with our characters to really pick apart what's going on with them and you have the introspection and you have this character moment over here with two people arguing or these two people making up after a fight or an argument that they had with each other Mm -hmm. that i i have played games as much as i have read that i did both voraciously there's this huge bookshelf behind me and then on the floor is like two-thirds more because it didn't all fit in the bookshelf when i moved into the most recent house so there, there are books and video games all over the place. <laughs> um, so one, one of the things that um, kind of struck me, and I think it would, would with anyone that, that picks up this book, is um, the, the scope of it. Um, not just in terms of uh, the vertical and horizontal action and, and, the, and the introspective kind of um, parts between characters, but time-wise, the scope is huge uh 
And one of the things when I kind of uh, reviewed it for on for the for the reading challenge was that um, one of the things that struck me is like we we both uh, enjoy Brandon Sanderson's work quite a lot, and um, I think I've seen you kind of mentioned him before and, and, and what have you. Um, and I kind of felt I I picked up Brandon Sanderson when I heard that he was going to take over and finish Wheel of Time. Mm-hmm. And then I, when that was kind of doing, I went and read his books that he had out already, which was like the Miss Vaughn books, and I enjoyed them. Um, and then he was always talking about this other series that he started and finished, <laughs> but like was like, I've not got the skill level to pull this off quite yet, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then after we kind of did a... Um, was working on the wheel of time he was like right okay um this is coming out i'm rewriting it and this and this and that was the the way of kings now there is similarities in the structure between your book and way of kings but what's uh, which i will mention is unintentional because i had written uh divinity's twilight rebirth the, the first entry before i ever touched a sanderson book um the yeah. first time i touched the sanderson book was 2019 Mm-hmm. And I actually started with The Way of Kings. Um, everyone says you should start with Mistborn, you should start with Warbreaker. And I hopped into A Way of Kings and it was fantastic. I, I just immediately fell in love, read everything that he had ever written within probably six months. Mm-hmm. And then I looked at what he wrote and then I looked what, at what I'd already crafted in Divinity's Twilight Rebirth and I went, huh, we think the same way. <laughs> and it, it was just really uncanny. Yeah, yeah. It's funny because I did this, uh, not just to go a, a brief side thing, I did the exact same thing with um, my Nick Holleran books with the Dresden files because I knew all the Dresden files, but I'd never read them. And um, I wrote the first Nick Holleran story and I was like, as a treat, I'm going to read the first Dresden book. And I was like, mm. oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> a- am I a hack? <laughs> am I derivative? Yes, yeah. I, I, I've been there with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, what what struck me was that um, obviously uh, Brandon Sanderson tried to do something with a huge scope, uh, with this fully fleshed out world, with this huge timeline, with this prologue that is like could be its own story if it was it could be taken away and expanded. But he didn't feel like he could do that until he'd gotten a couple of series under his belt, the end of the Wheel of Time under his belt, and he's like, now I'm ready to go and do this. This is your first book. And you did that. Um, so, you know... Um, well, thank you. you. That's really high praise. Yeah. So did you, did, did you realize what you were getting yourself into when you were writing it? As in, this is just huge. Or were you kind of like, you like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. I can do this. Not entirely. Because, so there's a few steps to this. Um, and I'm going to tell one story and try not to get too far off track. Now, I'm sure we can get off onto huge tangents. So the first story is how I got started with uh, Divinity's Twilight. And that was, I was in a second year thermodynamics lecture at the University of Virginia. And I was a little bit bored staring out the window and I had a lecture notes in front of me. So I flipped over the pamphlet and I started doodling a map on the back. And that is the map that eventually became the uh, Southern Lazaria, Southern continent map for Divinity's Twilight. And then the second map I produced later. And then I have a bunch more that are going to be in future books because we're going to keep expanding out in scope, like you said. Mm -hmm. Uh, But anyway, so that's how I got started. And then I I wrote the first few chapters and I I started with the villain, Sarkon, that I had an idea uh, for something involving him at the end of book three. So we're still working towards that. And I worked back from that event to the beginning. And again, this is still all in my head because um, I am much more of an outliner, a plotter now than I was before. But when I started, I was a pantser. And Divinity's Twilight Rebirth was almost entirely written off of pantsing. And I think that what saved me from going off the rails was that I've been a student of history and a student of science and a student of English and all these different things at the same time. And understanding how geography plays a role in culture and how culture plays a role in military expeditions and what people think of other races and how their how people's prejudices influence a justice system and everything is interconnected and linked and you can uh, 
press on these dominoes. It's like um, with the Stormlight Archive. Mm -hmm. uh, one of Sanderson's big things where he started was, what if I make a really harsh storm, a really harsh climate, and how does that affect everything else about that world? Mm -hmm. And so you, 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 you basically work out from your central idea, your central conceit. Mm -hmm. And this case, I worked off of geography and a villain and everything else took shape around those two things. Yeah, well, which is, um, you know, and I say people do, authors do pick different things. I mean, like you look at Tolkien, for example, his was language mm -hmm. that he built from, the language was the, was the thing. Um, and Robert Jordan was cultures. So he was kind of like, what would happen if I took Irish people and put them in the desert? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I should have mentioned my third pillar. Third pillar was airships. I knew I wanted airships. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so how, I mean, how long ago was this? When did you start work on, on, this, on this book? So I actually started work on this in 2012. And I got it, so I, you know, I started as the pantser. I hmm. got a few chapters in and I was taking engineering courses at the, at the time. I was halfway through my undergraduate degree in mechanical and aerospace engineering. And I had lots of homework, I had tests, everything was piling on top of me. And I went, eh, do I really wanna do something that's kind of work at the same time as I'm doing all this? And I actually tabled it after two or three chapters. Then I picked it back up again in 2017, I wanna say, so five years passed. And something struck me and I sat back down and I wrote 10 to 20 pages in a single day, that more than I've, I've ever written in, in my life. Uh, that was probably what, like 15,000 words, a, a transcendent day. And I realized that this is what I want to do. This is my passion. I, I have a story to tell. I need to get these characters onto the page. We need to go on this adventure. And that's how it spiraled off that I, I, I want, since then I've wanted nothing more than to be an epic fantasy author. Yeah. And I, I think that that's the same way for you or any other author, that it's just this yearning, this passion to tell a story. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, um, it's one of those things as well. It's like, uh, it's, I mean, it is hard work. And it is mm -hmm. a lot of times something you, you, you've got in your head and you're trying to get down. It doesn't quite work the way that you, you've got it there. And you've, you know, you've got to approach it in different ways, like, like almost like uh, problem solving. But mm -hmm. it's also it's enjoyable as well. <laughs> Right, I've had a lot of different jobs and over the years and, and what have you. And it's um, when I've when I've got my writing time at the end of the day, I'm kind of mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to it. I'm like I can't, I'm really looking forward. No, to that's it. your break. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, so obviously I can see your t-shirt there, uh, Middle Earth's annual, and like you know, um, yeah, very nice. Uh, it's the uh, uh, Middle Earth uh, annual uh, fun run. That Excellent. you go to mortar and it's supposed to be fun and enjoyable and it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I know, I've, I've seen you on your Instagram. You have you, you uh, kind of talk about quite a lot of um, your influences and, and things that you enjoy. So um, obviously, and all the books that are in the background, we we can see that you're a, an avid avid reader of of, uh, of fantasy. So what what was it that kind of um, if you remember, what was it that hooked you into into fantasy? Uh, so this is, this actually might be a tough one. Um, I think that it was the Redwall series by Brian Jocks, who is a UK native. Have you ever heard of him? Uh, yeah, I have. And funnily enough, Redwall is bigger in, in the States than it is in the UK. But, Interesting. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, it's one, of those, it's one of those things where it's just, um, it, it, you know, they get a bigger audience mm -hmm. somewhere else. But um, yeah, um, funnily enough, I have the game. I have the Xbox game to game out, like... <laughs> Two years ago, I think. Uh, oh. Apparently, doing they're doing a live action adaptation soon. Um, yeah. I don't know what service it's with, but I'm really excited for that. See if they get it right. Uh, basically, his tone, the essence. Yeah. Because he was yeah. a, he was an amazing storyteller. Um, the backstory. Um, he he very much had an MCU or a Stormlight Archive or I mean or a Cosmere before Brandon mm -hmm. Sanderson or Disney or or Marvel came up with these things. Yeah. That, yeah because every single one of his tales takes place at a different point on the timeline of, um, I won't call it Redwall because Redwall is an abbey in the world, but there is the forest of moss flower. And then there is the, the ocean, the mountain of Salamandastron. I, I don't know if you've read the books yourself, but there's a bunch of different geographical locations that feature through all of his books. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, I've, I've not, I've not read them. I mean, I know of them. And mm -hmm. like I played, I say I played them. Um, 
the, the video game, which is called Red One. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, but like, I, so it's one of those things that I've always kind of looked at and gone like, I'll, I will read this at some <laughs> point. Uh, so what, what was it about? Was it just the, um, just the- So the, it was probably the first book or series that I was handed. Um, that uh, second or third grade, my mom or dad, I forget which, they handed me the first three books of Redwall. Um, Redwall, Mossflower, and Matameo. And I, I read through them. I loved them. The feasting, the uh, character moments between the, because it's anthropomorphic animals that they're able to, to speak and talk like human beings. And you have your clean animals that are the good guys and your vermin that are the bad guys. And there's, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, it, it doesn't, it's middle grade, but it doesn't shy away from hard themes that there's death and destruction of the countryside, that there are, um, it's very much a coming of age story, many of them, that it's about the, the young mouse uh, standing up for the Abbey or going on an adventure, stepping out of home for the first time, leaving their comfort zone. Um, a lot of good lessons for somebody that's growing up. And in many ways, it's also a little bit of military fantasy that um, a lot of the terms about weapons, armor, tactics, um, chain of command, anything that you'd expect to find in a traditional military fantasy, well, it's present in this middle grade series, that he has maps that are put, that are inserted with battle lines, um, that there's great sieges, there is naval warfare. It, it, it's really a lot to put into 200 to 300 pages of what is being targeted at essentially elementary and middle school uh, kids. Um, and I, after that, of course, I went on to Lord of the Rings, but I, I, from second to fourth grade, I don't think I knew a book existed outside of the Redwall series, <laughs> that I read them all three or four times, the bindings tattered, uh, the ink smeared, uh, just a really great experience, I inundated myself in that. Uh -oh. But then after that, uh, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, um, what was after that? Um, I did Jay Kristoff. Um, but actually, the series that made me realize I wanted to write fantasy was um, Shadows of the Apt by Adrian Tchaikovsky, mm -hmm. who's, a, who's another Brit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. yeah, he's, he's going to be at the, we're talking off there before about fantasy comics, but he's going to be there next week, actually. So I'm, uh, I'm going to go up to him with, with some of my books and go, would you, would you mind just please sign this, please? Yeah. <laughs> uh huh. So have you have you read Shadows of the App? I have, yeah, yeah, I have, yeah. Uh, yeah, I I loved it. It 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 showed me that you can take a hard military, um, basically hard military fiction, and a te and technology, basically the engineering, and you can tell a fantasy story around it. Mm -hmm. And that combined two of my key areas of interest. And then eventually I got to Brand Sanderson, and I realized, well, I like to tell these epic stories with lots of magic too. And yeah. because I, I was essentially trying to do a Shadows of the Apt with magic being a uh, hard magic, um, both technology and what people are able to use in spells and with their blood mm -hmm. as key catalysts for conflict. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that is something that um, that you do very well in, the, in this book. And obviously, Sanderson does it well. But his is... Uh, with the um, with the Mistborn books in particular, they're almost kind of like superheroes. I always kind of mm -hmm. find. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're you're Baz uh, Did you ever read um, Ian Ir Ian Irvin, who did the um, what? He did, I can't remember the name of the first one now, but he was also um, he did a book called Alchemist. Was the first one? Oh no, I haven't heard of it. No, it's, it's good. They're really interesting. They're very. Um, he's an Australian um, author, and they're very kind of gritty. Uh, are very pulpy actually as well, um, but they have these. This again, there's a magic system, uh, and there's a very kind of hard science in it as well. Um, mm -hmm. You should ch ch look them up so you can find them. They're really interesting. I think that might be something that you'd that you'd enjoy. Um, but also as well, they're like really just so fast paced like that. I remember um, the fourth book in the series. I think it is the the, so the third book ends on this huge cliffhanger mm -hmm. where like all the main characters have been captured and they're about to be executed <laughs> right and it's literally uh -huh. just about to be executed on this on this uh floating platform like which is kind of like an airship and um the next book opens and the first chapter is 200 pages <laughs> it's just this huge action scene that takes place on 
thing and it just keeps on going and going and going and going um it's quite it's quite impressive uh, but i've never really kind of come across anyone who's ever read it before so it's one of those things I'm like check it out is it is it traditionally published yeah it's a traditionally published one yeah it's um so I, i'm a, i'm amazed because i know i have a long prologue and I, I'm amazed that somebody could get away with 200 pages of a of, of continuous scene that just spirals yeah, off. It just keeps going on. It just yeah. keeps going, going, going. It's uh, yeah. Um, I remember. I actually think I was reading it. I, I picked it up. I was traveling somewhere. I was, I was on a flight, and I picked it up that morning. And I was just like the entire flight, and then where I was going, I was still reading this same this same bit of this book, and it was just oh, it was incredible. It's but, just amazing. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's this just fun. Uh, but as you as you just mentioned there, with um, traditionally published, but obviously you're an independent uh, yes. author. Yes, uh, I'm in, I'm in between. It's a it's a it's a small imprint. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm I'm similar as well with with, mm -hmm. with with my ones. So what is it you what is it you like about uh, that kind of model? What what does it give you a little bit more flexibility or? Um, it, it does because what I like to do is um, obviously ebook is the bread and butter of an indie author that that's where they're your quickest way to reach your audience and also your cheapest way to reach your audience. But I also like to um, like we were discussing before the show going to events that I like to meet fans I like to sign books and I love physical copies myself and so I love when I'm able to put a physical copy in somebody else's hands, especially because I love fantasy maps and I think that everybody needs to be able to open the book and look at the the cool maps that uh, Terry Johnson did for me uh, very much the style of Lord of the Rings, but porting it to a more modern fantasy. Mm -hmm. Um, and so having a quality paperback was very important to me, which is why I sought out an imprint. And yeah. what, what I get with that is I, I get a quality paperback. I get it within a reasonable amount of time and at a reasonable price. And on, and on the ebook distribution, you do lose a little bit of your royalties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's just deciding whether you want to be well-rounded or whether you want to be focused on one thing. And, and of course, I'm going to be looking into producing an audio book for Divinity's Twilight in the next couple of months. So that's going to be fun. Yeah. And, and we can't not mention the cover as well, because the cover is a beautiful piece of art. Yes. This is uh, Chris McGrath. You mentioned uh, Jim Butcher earlier that mm -hmm. in the Dresden Files. So this is the same guy that does Dresden Files and the, that did the uh, U.S. Mistborn covers. And yeah. actually, the Mistborn covers are what led me to him, uh, because when I, I started writing the series, I thought, well, I need a, a great, realistic, gritty style like this to really bring uh, Lazari and Demise Twilight to life. And I started going through Art Station, all these different things, and couldn't find anything that worked. And I took the book um, and I, I think I was having a discussion with my father and my mother about it. And I said, I really want art like this. And they said, well, why don't you just email that guy? And I said, well, he, he works for Jim Butcher and Brandon Sanderson, and I'm, I'm just debuting. There's, there's no way that he's going to do my art. And they said, well, just send him an email. So I sent him an email. He's like, yeah, I'd really love to do this. This sounds like an awesome project. And it is his number on his website and his social media. It's still his number one up, most upvoted comment uh, uh, cover with a lot of praise and accolades. And I, I'm just floored by what a great job he did. And he's actually told me that for book two, that he's going to try to outdo himself because he says that he, he that if this was his best cover to, to date, that he wants to do even better for the next one. Yeah, well, it's, uh, let's hope he does. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a hard one to top. And like some of his recent, the, the, the last two Dresden covers have been really good as well. Mm -hmm. Like he's really, it's like he's really at a high level at the moment. So if he's going to try and top this, then good luck. <laughs> and can't wait to see what's like. But also as well, talking about topping things, I mean, we keep mentioning your book and we're just we're calling it, uh, you know, Rebirth, Divinity's Twilight. But it's, we should be calling it the award-winning uh, yes, it has won the um, the Ozma Award for Best Fantasy of 2020, and it actually recently got the American uh, Fiction Award, American Book Fest Fiction Award for uh, Best High Slash Epic Fantasy of 2021. I haven't uh, officially announced that, so I guess this is the official announcement for that. <laughs> so, uh, well, congratulations on that. That's brilliant news. Thank you. Um, and you have to top this with... I do. Yeah, so how is book so, two coming along? So book two is I'm working on draft number two. And what I've I've discovered 
uh, from book one to book two is that I am a big rewriter, that I take the skeleton of a scene um, and some of the muscles, like the, the dialogue points that I think that worked or the set pieces, and I rewrite the scene around it. That I, it's a very organic process to me. And I think that that's the panzer that's still beating inside my heart that the plotter hasn't fully killed. And so right now my alpha readers are, I'm about probably 30, 35% through draft two. And I expect to be done in another uh, month and a half, two months. And then it's going to go out to beta readers. But the alpha readers are saying that they think it's even better than book one, which I, I'm thrilled to hear. Cool. That's what you want. That's what you want to hear. Yep. Uh, and part <laughs> one that um, I've just wrapped up is a lot of in, it's a lot of character moments because we have the fallout from book one. We have um, um, a lot of deaths in the uh, not necessarily in the party, but deaths related to the party that people haven't processed. Um, we have a lot of stuff going on on the global stage. Um, this is a very much a tale of the fates of kingdoms and empires, and eventually of gods and deities themselves that's working in the background, hence the title Divinity's Twilight. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot to unpackage there. Um, start off with, of course, with action. We um, are bringing a little bit of the mythology to the fore. One of the very first things the characters have to deal with is a mytho mythological creature called a draken that isn't supposed to exist anymore. And they stumble across and it is drawn to um, Illyrium. The, the energy that the crystals give off, that's its food source. And so they naively hang around a place where there's a bunch of this Illyrium and it, it pops up because it's made its nest nearby. Right. And so uh, the characters have to deal with that. And at the same time on the halfway across the continent, we have the, the ongoing war that um, if you remember uh, Ritter Marshall Valescar, that he mm -hmm. gets a little bit more uh, POV treatment in order to detail what's happening with Raban, because um, Raban wasn't as big of a factor in the war in book one. Okay, perfect. So it's, it sounds like, it's, I mean, obviously with, with, with um, the, the scope and size of, of, uh, of book one, there's a lot of things to kind of uh, tie off, but there's a lot of things yes. to follow. And it sounds, it sounds like you're bringing new things into it as well. So yes. how, how big, um, how long is this series gonna be in your mind at the moment? So in my mind, it is a 10 book series like um, the Stormlight Archive. Yeah. And it's going to, so where Sanderson has five and five, I'm looking at six and four, that it's going to take six books to wrap up the primary conflict with some loose ends left over to be dealt with after a time skip. Mm -hmm. So that we're going to get to be able to see Lazaria one to two decades down the line when, okay. after that time skip. Excellent. That sounds good. I love that. I love a time jump like that. It's, it's one of my favorite. It's funny. Uh, I, I, the last uh, offer I was talking to Rachel Renner. She's just done that herself in her series, The Lightning Country. Mm -hmm. So she's had that uh, time skip. And um, so uh, people that are watching um, from today onwards, that there is going to be, if you want to check out uh, Rebirth of the Twilight, uh, Christopher can tell you that why this is the perfect time to check it out. So, like David was saying, it's the perfect time because it is going to be free in celebration of its anniversary. Divinity's Twilight Rebirth was officially published on September 22nd, 2020, and so it's been one year. And so from September 21st all the way to September 25th, it is going. the ebook is going to be free on all digital platforms. So that's your Amazon, whatever country you're in. That is your Kobo. That is your Apple, your Google Play, wherever you get your eBooks, you will be able to download Divinity's Twilight Rebirth for free and get started on this epic fantasy adventure before we get into book two next year. And mm -hmm. uh, also along with that, um, whether you go to my website or you go to any of those digital platforms, you'll also be able to get uh, Gravitas, um, A Tale of the Constella, which is an epic fantasy short. It is going to be permanently free, not just from September 21st to 25th. Um, it was originally published in the IFA anthology from the shadows, but the cool thing about Gravitas is it takes place on a different world than Divinity's Twilight Rebirth, but it is within a wider universe that I'm going to be playing in called the Constella, that uh, doing that MCU thing, that Cosmere thing that Brandon Sanderson and other authors have done. And I have a lot of cool things to tie in with the mythology, the way that planets and planes and magic work in different places, 
um, and different players that are that have interest on these various worlds. Exactly. Uh, Divinity yeah. Twilight, of course, is the main series. That's what you the, the, you can get stuck into first. Yes, definitely. And I say, like, you know, people should have it already, but if you don't, then you've got no excuse. <laughs> right. Absolutely. But, I appreciate the download and checking out the material. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So um, before before we wrap this up, um, other than work on, on book two, is there anything else in the pipeline for yourself or is it just head down? So uh, I, I'm in a bunch of different directions, but um, for now, my goal is to get through book three of Divinity's Twilight Rebirth um, in the next year and a half. So February or March, we release book two. I'd like to, by winter of 2022, or early 2023 to have book three in people's hands. And so that'll be the first half of that first six book cycle. And then, like I said, I'm writing in a combined universe. I have another world that I have written um, half a book on and it's called Descendants of Dusk. And it is an Asian fantasy taking place on yet another world. And the cool thing about that is that it's sort of a post-apocalyptic setting, very frigid, very cold that you're going to need something to allow these people to survive. And that is the magic system that they have, that it's based on thermodynamics mm -hmm. and get to explore a lot of things about um, class structure with that because the original people that got this thermodynamics magic have been essentially monopolizing it, that it is attached to their bloodlines and people have to cluster around them in order to survive in this frigid wasteland. So. Mm -hmm. It's very much a feudal system, not a futile system, a feudal system. Yes. That was interesting. I'm looking forward to that. So hopefully, so by 2024, we'll probably have a whole yes. universe of stuff to play in. That's a... It's, and it's, then um, Allegra Pescatore, I don't know if you've met, talked yeah. to her. She mm -hmm. and I are working on a satirical fantasy that uses time travel and is a spoof on the chosen one trope. So that's another cool thing in the pipeline. Excellent. And she, she's uh, got great experience of working with authors. Mm -hmm. she, she enjoys that and she's a great writer herself as well. So mm -hmm. that sounds brilliant. Um, Christopher, thanks so much for, for coming on to the show and um, best of luck with, with the promotion on, on, um, on, the, on Rebirth and going forward, I can't wait to read book two. Thank you so much, David. It's been a pleasure.